Well, we have another treat in store. Sam Aubrey is about to come and speak to us from a passage of Scripture I'm going to read. It's John chapter 17, and I'm going to read from verse 20. John chapter 17, verse 20. And this is Jesus praying. My prayer is not for them alone, his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I wonder if Sam, you join me so I can pray for you. Sam Aubrey is probably well known to you from his writing. Uh, some of you may even remember him. He was a, a student pastor at St. Ebbs, Oxford, was ordained uh, back in those heady days, uh, has worked subsequently for St. Mary's Maidenhead, and now is working full-time for Zach Trust, who allow him to go and work for the Gospel Coalition, looking particularly at issues of, of sexuality, uh, where he brings a lot of expertise to that. So, Sam, you've served us really well already. We're delighted that you can join us this evening to take us more deeply into what it means to live and speak for Jesus in everyday life, apologetics for everyday life. Can I pray for you? Do. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for Sam, for all you have done in him and all you are doing through him. We thank you for the message he's prepared. We pray that you would give him a great sense of freedom and unction, give him clarity and authority, and may our hearts and minds be receptive to what you have to say to us by your spirit, through your word, and we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's good to be with you this evening. If you want to keep your Bibles open in John 17, which we've just had read for us. Um, I had a meeting this week with the Charities Commission in London. Uh, it's a ministry I'm involved with, and they wanted to check we were fulfilling all the bits we were meant to be doing. And uh, the guy I was meeting with said to me halfway through the meeting, he said, I've been looking at your activities, and he said, I've got a question for you. What is apolog, apolog, apolog something? And I said, apologetics. He said, yeah, what, what is that? Because you, you seem to be doing it, and I've got no idea what it is. So I tried to explain it's that part of kind of Christian thought and ministry where we try to come up with answers to the, the biggest questions and the biggest objections people have to the Christian faith. And he said, can you give me some examples? So I said, well, how do you know that Jesus is the truth? Um, how can a loving God allow so much suffering? Um, all these kinds of things. And the, the meeting proceeded smoothly from that point. And that's what we're thinking about tonight. We're going to continue to think about apologetics. But we're not going to think about apologetics in terms of what we say we're going to think about apologetics in terms of how we live, and in particular, how we live with one another as the people of God. Because this passage says something amazing. Uh, this passage shows us that there, there is a way for the world to know that Jesus was sent by the Father to draw a people to himself. There's a way for the world to know that from how we live together as God's people. So keep John 17 open in front of you. As Richard said, it's a, a prayer. We're listening to Jesus pray. 
There are a number of times when we see Jesus praying in the Gospels. Uh, this is one of the few times we get to listen in. And it's certainly the longest prayer that we have of Jesus, I think. Um, I don't know if you... I'm a bit geeky about these things. I, I love DVD extra features. So I'll often buy a DVD, watch the extra features first, and then watch the movie. Which is sad, I can sense, uh, for some of you. But in the best cases, the extra features are amazing. You get a, a Peter Jackson or a Steven Spielberg telling you about how they did what they did, and it just gives you such insight into what they've done. And this prayer is a bit like a DVD extra feature. We are eavesdropping, if you like, on a behind-the-scenes conversation within the Trinity about what is going on. And so there is a huge amount of insight for us as we listen to the Eternal Son praying to the Eternal Father. And even more amazing than that, Jesus is praying about us. The whole of this chapter is a prayer. In verses 1 to 5, Jesus prays for himself. In verses 6 to 19, he prays for his kind of immediate band of followers and, and apostles around him. But in verse 20, Jesus prays for those who will come to believe in him. So verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone, the, the people around him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So this passage is Jesus praying for you and Jesus praying for me. And Jesus is assuming something that his followers would have found extraordinary. Because Jesus is assuming that after he's gone, after he's returned to heaven, he's assuming the gospel is going to be fruitful. He's assuming that the story is not going to end with this small band of nervous and flawed disciples. Jesus is assuming generations of believers are going to follow down through the centuries. And the passage shows us how that is going to happen. Um, I minister in a, a Church of England context, and therefore I have three points. I sometimes have nightmares that one day I'm going to preach on a passage and it's going to have four main <laughs> things to say and somehow I'm going to have to get them into three. So we're going to think uh, this evening about our belief, about God's love and about the world's response. So firstly, we're going to think about our belief. How do people come to faith? Look at how Jesus describes it in verse 20. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So Jesus is saying people will believe in him through the message of the apostles. And so if we want to see people believe in Jesus, in the Jesus we've been singing about, in the Jesus we've been praising, in the Jesus that we pray to and worship, they are going to need to hear the message of the apostles. Uh, Jesus has shown us uh, in earlier parts of John's Gospel that the apostles are going to be shown the truth by his teaching and also by the inspiration and help of the Holy Spirit. And the message they will then have will be the means by which people put their trust in Jesus. It is the way Jesus has chosen to reveal himself. And so if we ditch what the apostles say, we are ditching evangelism. Uh, without the message of the apostles, we cannot hope to bring people to Christ. So we need the truth. We need the truth of the apostles' message. But notice we need, we need more than that. Uh, notice what Jesus prays for. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father. Jesus prays for unity. Of all the things Jesus could have prayed for, this is what this son chooses to ask the father. And remember when this is happening. 
Uh, this is the night before Jesus' death. In just a matter of moments, he is going to be handed over and betrayed. He's about to go through literal hell for us. And at this point, having been able to pray for anything, Jesus prays that we would be one. And he prays for it three times. Verse 21, that all of them may be one. Verse 22, uh, that they may be one as, as we are one. Verse 23, may they be brought to complete unity. This matters. It was on the heart of Jesus moments before he was handed over. It was on the heart of Jesus as he thought of you and me to pray for unity. Now notice the unity Jesus is talking about. It is unity among those who believe in him through the message of the apostles. It's not wider than that and it's not narrower than that. It's not bigger than that and it's not smaller than that. Now, I think we often get Christian unity wrong in our thinking. Uh, there's a, a story about a guy who was walking through a city uh, in the States. And as he walked along, he saw a man standing on a bridge looking like he was going to jump. And so he quickly tries to engage this guy in conversation, try and talk him back from the edge of this bridge. And he says, don't you believe in God? And the guy says, yes, I do. And he says, oh, are you... Are you a Christian or a Jew? He says, I'm a Christian. Protestant or, or Catholic? Protestant. What, what denomination are you? I'm, I'm a Baptist. Southern Baptist or, or Northern Baptist? <laughs> oh, Northern Baptist. Oh, well, so am I. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist or are you uh, a Northern Liberal Baptist? And he says, I'm a, a Northern Conservative Baptist. Oh, so am I. Are you a Northern Conservative Reformed Baptist or a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist? And the guy says, I'm a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. All oh, right, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Northeast region? The guy says, I'm a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region. Okay, so are you a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879? Or are you a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? He says, oh, I'm a Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. At which point the guy says, die heretic, and pushes him off the bridge. <laughs> And you applaud. <laughs> um, I don't think that's a true story, much as part of me would like it to be so. But it does serve to, to show us we, we often get Christian unity wrong in our thinking. Uh, the unity Jesus is talking about is a unity between those who are believing in him through the message of the apostles. It's not unity on every single detail of every single aspect of the Christian life. There are issues over which we can legitimately differ as believers. Uh, Paul says in Romans 14 and 15, there are such things as disputable matters. Uh, we might think of, of an issue like baptism or the millennium in, in Revelation. But there is at the same time an irreducible core truth that is not up for grabs. Uh, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 15, we were thinking about this last night, that there are matters of first importance. There are primary issues. And over those things, there can be no disagreement. And so the unity Jesus speaks of allows for difference over secondary issues. But if there's a difference over primary issues, the unity we have is not Christian unity. And it's something I think that the CU movement reflects wonderfully well. That doctrinal basis is a great gift to us. The right kind of breadth and the right kind of narrowness. Now Jesus is saying that the, the message of the apostles, when it leads to faith in him, 
will create a oneness among those who believe. There is a bond between us. So we think about our belief. Secondly, we think about God's love. Jesus has just said there's a oneness, there's a bond. Uh, The fact is there are lots of groups of people in the world and there's lots of connection and there's lots of love within those groups. Uh, If you take your local tennis club, if someone's ill, others will rally round. So what is it about this community and this love and this oneness that's different? Rallies was not an intentional pun, in case some of you were... (laughs) I could hear murmuring. (laughs) No, the oneness, the unity, the love Jesus is talking about among his people is not ultimately human in origin. And he shows us why that is. Look again at verse 21. Uh, He prays that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus says our unity, our oneness, is to be like the the unity and oneness that the Father and the Son enjoy. He says it again in, in verse 22, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And so our unity is like the unity of the Father and the Son. But it's more than that. It's not just that our unity is like theirs. It's not just that we've we've studied the Trinity and then copied them. No, Jesus says our unity is grounded in theirs. Look again at verse 21. That they may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. It's not a question of imitation. It's a question of participation. Our unity is like the unity of the Father and the Son because we are sharing the unity of the Father and the Son. We are being invited into the love and unity of the Trinity. The love they have, the love they've enjoyed for eternity, they are inviting us into. God the Trinity has opened up his inner life and includes us in. And my friends, this takes us to the very heart of the gospel. It is something I would not believe if this passage didn't say it. And we've just been singing of it. Have a look again at verse 23. He prays that we might be one, And then he says, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me. And friends, get this bit. This is astonishing. You have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Or verse 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. Jesus is saying, and it's astonishing even as I utter the words to you tonight, Jesus is saying that we can be as loved by the Father as the Son himself is. Do you see that? All that Jesus has done for us means that we can be as loved by the Father as he is. Um, I had a flight a a while ago where I booked up my, my ticket and as I booked my ticket I thought, well, I know someone who flies for this airline. I'll drop him a line and let him know I'm flying with his airline. So I wrote to my friend and said, I've just booked up on this flight. I'm on this route. I know you sometimes fly this route. Any chance you're going to be flying me? And he wrote back and said, I'll have a look at the rotor and I'll, I'll see what I can do. And a week or so before the flight, he uh, wrote to me and said, I'm going to be flying you. 
I'm going to be captain. So I'll, I'll come and find you in the departure lounge. So I, I got excited at this point. Well, this, this, this could be interesting. I went to the departure lounge. I dressed in a jacket and tie, thinking just in case he needs to move me anywhere nearer the front of the plane, <laughs> I want to look like I would belong there, that that would be a natural place for me to end up. Well, he came into the departure lounge looking all captain-y, and uh, he came up to me and said, Sam, make sure you are the last person to board the aircraft. Just wait for everybody else to board. Then at the end, you come on, and when the cabin crew greets you, tell them that you are my guest. And I thought, well, this sounds promising. This sounds, <laughs> this sounds good. Sounds like I might not be in my seat. So I waited for everyone else. I got on the plane, and, and immediately one of the cabin crew said, oh, you're the captain, aren't you? And I said, I am, yes. And she said, would you please follow me? We turned left. That's a good thing. Uh, we walked into business class. And we walked through business class into first class. And we walked through first class. I was thinking, what comes after first class? This is, this is extraordinary. And the answer is the cockpit comes after first class. And she took me into the cockpit. My friend sat me down and said, Sam, it's great to, great to see you. Take a seat there. He sat me in the jump seat behind him and the first officer. I think they've changed the rules now so that people like me can't get anywhere near the controls of a plane. But they sat me down in the jump seat, and, they, and I stayed there the entire flight for seven hours. And it was wonderful. I, I, the, the crew could not do enough for me. They kept saying, is there anything you want? If you want anything off the menu, just let us know. If you want to nip into first class and have a snooze or watch a movie, you can do that. And I was thinking, this is the best ever in-flight movie I'm ever going to get in my life. It was a daytime flight. I could see left, front, and right. It was amazing. Uh, they kept checking I was happy and had everything I wanted. And right at the end of the flight, after we landed, uh, one of the staff came up with a goodie bag of presents and said, Sam, we just want to thank you for being our guest today on our flight. A big bottle of champagne and lots of other goodies as well. And so I said to this this crew member, the only thing I could think of saying, which was, anytime. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I can, you know, flexibility in my diary, if, you, if it would help, I can come back anytime. Just, just let me know. I'll cancel stuff. I can, I can be available to, to be a guest again, if it would, if it would help. Now, it was an amazing experience, and, and needless to say, it's ruined every flight ever since. <laughs> but all of that happened because I was the guest of the captain. And so every courtesy that is normally given to him was extended to me. And it's all because I came in as his friend. And when I came in as his friend, I came in at his level. And Jesus is showing us that when we come to the Father through the Son, we come in at the Son's level. That when God draws us to himself, he draws us in the whole way. I'm not just forgiven as a sinner. I'm adopted and included as a son. And the love the Father has for Jesus, he now has for me. And Jesus says when that love comes into our lives, when that love is real to us, it changes us and the world notices. So our final point is the world's reaction. Bless you. Wow. Wow. That sounded painful. <laughs> if you need a medic or a doctor, just, just let us know. Uh, look again at what Jesus is assuming in these verses. 
when we have received this love of the Father for the Son, we show it to one another. The sign that you've received this love is that you express it. And when we express it as God's people to each other, the world will notice. So Jesus says again, verse 23, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved, sorry, loved them even as you have loved me. As we express this unity, as we show this oneness, it will show the world that the Father has really sent the Son and that the love that animates us and fuels us and shapes our behavior is divine love. Uh, we see this love modelled, this unity modelled in the early church, and it's it's supernatural in two ways. It's supernatural in the way that it's it's a sacrifice. It's costly love. Uh, we see the early church in Acts chapter four sharing their possessions and their wealth. Uh, we read that all the believers were one in heart and mind. What does that look like? No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them. The passage describes people selling their houses, selling their lands, and distributing the money to those who were needy. We see radical hospitality going on among God's people in the early church. Wallets are opened, hearts are opened, homes are opened up to brothers and sisters. As we receive this love from the Father, it creates a bond between us. We're family. We're one. As God draws me to himself, he draws me to you. We're like spokes on the wheel. The closer we get to the center, the closer we get to one another. And it's a reminder that there is no such thing as a kind of privatized Christianity. Well, I've got my faith, but it's just, it's just me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I do Jesus, I don't do church. No, the love the Father has shown us is a love that binds us to one another, a love that creates a sense of oneness among us. That love is sacrificial, but also it's impartial. We end up showing love and expressing unity and oneness with, with people that we have no earthly business being close to. The pattern of this world is that like attracts like. We, we stick to our type, whatever that type is, but that is not the case with the gospel. It binds together people who would otherwise have nothing to do with each other. And we see that particularly in, the, in the, the, the letter to the Ephesians. God makes a new humanity out of people who would otherwise be utterly apart. And nowhere was that more the case than with the Jews and the Gentiles. And yet Paul can say in Ephesians 2, yet God himself has made the two one and destroyed the barrier. His purpose was to create in himself one new man. The gospel joins together people who would otherwise be separate. I heard somebody share recently how powerful it was at a Christian event to have a, a Palestinian Arab and an Israeli Jew praying together as brothers in Christ, both having come to faith. The gospel transcends every difference, and our oneness is meant to show that. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 3 that God's intent was that now, through the church, through the body of God's people, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This unity in what would otherwise be utter difference 
is God's way of demonstrating to the spiritual forces, to the universe, to all of reality, that he is wise. And so the church, the people of God, the Christian community in its oneness, is God's mic drop to the universe. God can point to his people, reconciled across every human difference. He can look to the the powers and the principalities, point to the church and go, And so, friends, what does this mean? It means you are not supposed to be friends with the very same people you would have been friends with if Jesus hadn't died and risen again. Do you get that? You're not supposed to be friends with the very people you would have been friends with if Jesus hadn't died and rose again. We are meant to relish that oneness with all kinds of people. And a watching world will have no other way to account for it other than the fact that it has come from above. It is not earthly. As I close, Neptune was the first planet discovered not by observation, but by mathematics. That wasn't the case that someone looked out of a window one day and like, oh, there's a planet. That's allegedly what happened with all the others. It's probably a bit more complicated than that. But it wasn't that someone saw Neptune and was like, oh, oh, there's there's a planet there. No, someone had worked out that Neptune must exist and had worked out exactly where it did exist a guy called John Couch Adams, in the 1840s. Uh, He'd been tracking the orbit of another planet, Uranus. Just get that out of our system. (laughs) Get it out of my system. I have the mind of a 12-year-old. But my note says that... (laughs) There were irregularities in the direction of Uranus, which um, (laughs) I figured I wasn't going to get away with saying in one go. So um, there we are. But anyway, that planet, that planet didn't follow the path it was meant to. It didn't track along the kind of the path they had predicted. And the only explanation was, there's this kind of big kink in its orbit, The only explanation was there must be something else, another planet further out whose gravity is tugging at it and making its orbit different. And so they could extrapolate from those irregularities exactly where Neptune must be. Now I mention that because we are to be marked by the love and unity of God himself. And as the world looks at how we relate to each other as Christians, on campus, in our churches, the world should see all kinds of deviations from the way life normally works. All kinds of irregularities, all kinds of ways in which we don't behave in the way that everybody else does. They should see us showing unworldly care for each other. They should see us grouping together with people we would otherwise have no earthly business being with. And as the world looks on it, she'll be able to say, well, actually, there must be a greater unseen presence that is causing this behavior. They should be able to extrapolate from our love and our unity and know that actually this has to be from God. This has to be from above. That is what ultimately will knock down the arguments of the sceptics. I say this as someone who works for an apologetics organization, the Zacharias Trust, but there is a kind of apologetics that only the Christian community can do. And that is to show this oneness that reflects the oneness of God himself. Well, let me pray for us as we seek to be the people of God in a way that the world will be changed by us. Let's pray.
Our Father, we thank you that the love you have enjoyed forever with the Son, you have shared with his people. Father, thank you that we can know that we are as loved by you as Jesus is. We thank you so much for what he came to do. And Father, we pray that we would reflect that love among each other, that we would show that oneness that Jesus prayed for, that oneness that you have shown us. And may a watching world be forced to say that that has come from you. Help us, please, in our lives together to show a love that cannot be found anywhere else. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.